کرنا چاہتا ہوں ایک تو یہ کہ بہت کم ایسی جگہیں ہیں ہندوستان میں جہاں پر ایسا مجمع ہو گمبھیر مدوں پر اور خاص طور پر ربی بار کے دن اتنے لوگ آئیں اور شریک ہوں تو بدائی ہو آپ سب کو اس کارکرم کو جن لوگوں نے آئیو جد کیا ہے ان لوگوں کو بھی یہ ہیدرآباد شہر میں میں بیس سال پہلے تھا اور ایک لگاو ہے میرا اس شہر سے بہت کم شہر ہندوستان میں ہیں جن کی کوئی اپنی تہذیب ہو کوئی اپنا ثقافت ہو دلی والا ہونا یا احمد آبادی ہونا یہ کوئی خاص بات نہیں لیکن ہائیدر آبادی ہونا یہاں کی موسیق کی یہاں کی زبان زبان جو بھی نام سے آپ آپ جانیں اس کو ہندی ہندوستانی اردو اور ایک اور نام ہے دخنی ماضی میں اس زبان کو رختہ کے نام سے جانا جاتا تھا غالب کا کہنا ہے کہ رختہ کے تم ہی استاد نہیں ہو غالب کہتے ہیں اگلے زمانے میں کوئی میر بھی تھا یہ جس میر کا ذکر کر رہے ہیں میر تقی میر وہ لکھتے ہیں کہ خوگر نہیں کچھ یوں ہی ہم رختہ گوئی کہ معشوق جو اپنا تھا باشندہ دخن تھا اس کا ترجمہ کریں تو میں کچھ یوں ہی اردو کا شاعر نہیں ہوں میں شاعر اس لیے ہوں کیونکہ جو میرا معشوق جو میرا پریمی تھا وہ دخنی تھا جو رختہ لکھتا اور یہ جس معشوق کی بات میر کر رہے ہیں اس کا نام تھا ولی محمد ولی جس کو ولی دخنی کے نام سے بھی جانا جاتا ہے جس کو ولی گجراتی کے نام سے بھی جانا جاتا ہے ولی محمد ولی کی پیدائش یہاں کی ہے دخن کی لیکن ان کا کام ان کو شوہر ملا اور ان کی موت ہوئی گجرات میں جس صوبے سے بہت پیار تھا اس کو یہ ہم جانتے ہیں کیونکہ کچھ چیزیں لکھی ہیں ولی نے جیسے کہ در فراق گجرات on separation from گجرات اور ایک مصنوی ہے تعریف شہر صورت جو کہ میرا شہر ہے ولی کا انتقال سترہ سو سات میں ہوا جس سال میں کچھ لوگ جانتے ہوں گے کہ عالمگیر اورنگ زیب کی موت بھی ہوئی تھی اور ان کو دفنایا گیا جو مزار ہے ولی کا وہ احمد آباد کے پولیس کمیشنر کے دفتر کے گیٹ کے بالکل باہر ہے ہے نہیں تھا تو دو ہزار دو میں جو فساد ہوئے آہ اس کے پہلے دن اٹھائیس فروری کی رات کو اس مزار کو توڑ دیا گیا اور رات و رات اس پہ ڈامر لگا کے جو راستہ تھا اس کو بالکل صاف کیا گیا اس پہ ایک بت لگایا گیا ہماری گجراتی میں اس کو کہتے ہیں ہلڑیو ہنوان رائٹس رائٹس ہنوان تو کچھ سال پہلے میں نے مودی صاحب کو ایک شام ولی کی کچھ چیزیں میں نے پڑھ کر سنائی تھی وہ شاید واقف نہیں تھے اس شخص سے یا وہ جانتے بھی نہیں تھے کہ یہ شخص گجرات سے کتنا پیار کرتا تھا تو میں نے کہا کہ صاحب یہ ایک دخنی سپوت ایک گجراتی سپوت کیا کو ہم پھر اس کا وقار لوٹا دیں تو یہ ٹھیک ہوگا انہوں نے وائدہ کیا تھا کہ کچھ کریں گے لیکن جیسا کہ میں نے آپ سے کہا کچھ سالی سے 
हो चुके हैं और और कुछ हुआ नहीं है तो इस मंच से एक गुजराती दखन से फिर से ये मोदी जी से कहता है कि साहब कुछ करें और वली के साथ जो हुआ वो ठीक नहीं हुआ और उसका वकार उसको लौटा दे आई स्पीक इन इंग्लिश द सब्जेक्ट वेरी ब्रॉडली इज इन वॉट वे डज इंग्लिश इंफ्लुएंस वॉट दैशनल प्रायोरिटीज आर ऑफ ऑफ दिस कंट्री एंड आई थिंक इट्स एन इंटरेस्टिंग सब्जेक्ट फॉर टू रीजन वन इज दैट वी आर अ यूनिक नेशन देर इज नो अदर नेशन in the world certainly there is no other nation of the size and importance of of india where the elite speaks a foreign language uh tolstoy used to have a bit of a uh, french in his novels and we know that uh many of the great russians of the 19th century had it because some part of the aristocracy spoke french but tolstoy's novels are all in russian and the pushkins and uh, dostoevskys and so on so though they might have some bits of uh, french it was primarily in their own language that they were writing and this is not the same as what we have here i think in india uh, the census says that about 10% of the population can read some form of english that includes people like us that includes uh, your uber driver who might be familiar with the script but not necessarily be able to communicate in it and there might be people slightly lower down who might be able to read for example signs on the road um, but nothing more than that i suspect and this is only a guess that it's about 2 and a half percent of this country that uses english as its first language by which i mean it's the language in which they do all their work it's the language in which they consume their news media that if they were to read a newspaper it would likely be one in english uh, certainly when they go to office it is the language they speak in if they were to consume a novel or a work of non fiction it would likely be in english they might have some knowledge of their mother tongue they might have a certain element of a familiarity with uh with hindi but it is not a language that they read in regularly nor is it a language that they are a uh, comfortable writing it's english that this 2 and a half percent um section of the population uses for the most part second unusual fact the media in india is subsidized in a way that in it is in no other country i write for a paper in pakistan uh owned by a, a gujarati family in karachi and papers there cost 19 rupees if you look at dawn which is the paper started by jinna or the news um which i used to write for all of these are about 19 20 rupees the same the same applies to newspapers in say lanka or uh, bangladesh certainly in the west newspapers cost a lot more uh the new york times and the guardian and so on would be about a dollar or a pound now the interesting thing here is that newsprint which is the material from which newspapers are made costs the same very few countries actually uh, produce it uh canada is the largest one and the cost per ton is universal everybody has to pay the same price to produce a 30 page or 24 page newspaper such as the times of india would cost the company about 14 rupees just for the material of the of of the paper and and print but uh, as we know newspapers in india are not sold at that price uh, they're sold at about 3 rupees or 4 rupees or 5 rupees at the most who picks up the gap between the 5 rupees uh, that we pay and the 14 rupees that cost to print just to print mind you there are many other costs um and that and that that gap is uh, paid for by of course the the advertiser uh advertisers 
are interested in uh, consumers. They are not really interested in people who do not have the money to spend on their products and their services. And what this has done is these, these two things. One is a small elite that speaks a language that almost nobody else speaks. A subsidized, highly subsidized media that exists on spending by this segment uh, and is uh, paid for mostly by people uh, producing goods and services, the advertiser. What has happened is that media in India has become disinterested in almost anybody other than this two and a half percent. Yes, we do have newspapers which are not in English. We do have TV stations which are not, not in English. But that economic disparity uh, reflects there as well. And I'll give you a few numbers. Uh, Bennett Coleman and Company, which is uh, the paper, which, which is the company that uh, produces the Times of India, does about 9,000 crore rupees in revenue. And uh, the Times of India has about 75 lakh readers. There's not been a survey in the last year or so. But that's the ballpark uh, figure. The largest newspaper in India is uh, Dainik Jagaran, um, which has about two and a half times more readers, but it has only one-fifth the revenue. So for the advertiser, one of these individuals is worth 10 Dainik Jagaran readers. That is the revenue uh, disparity. And mind you, Jagaran and papers like Hindustan uh, and papers like Dainik Bhaskar, these are not only read by people in villages. They're also read by people in cities, in towns, what, what we call B-towns. Even so, the English reader commands a 1 is to 10 ratio from the advertiser. What that has done, and I'm quite familiar with this because it has happened in my time when I came into journalism uh, a couple of decades ago is when it actually started. Newspapers have focused their content entirely on this segment. The anxieties of, of this upper class, its needs, its wants, is what newspapers and English TV channels go after. That disparity which I spoke to you about in newspapers also exists in the English to Hindi news channel. That same amount of revenue uh, mismatch. Those of you who are old enough will know that they, and I'm giving you an example of what I mean. About 20 years ago, there would be these stories very regularly about something called a stove burst. And more or less the story would be like this, that a housewife is cooking on a kerosene stove and it explodes and her sari catches fire and she dies of, of burns. Uh, before she dies, she is taken to hospital and she records a statement where, she, where very often she says that it was her in-laws who did this um, and they, they had been asking for dowry for a long time. Um, we don't read such stories anymore in the Times of India. And some might think that it's because it's not happening um, anymore. The data shows that about 8,000 women die in this fashion each year in India. And this number, this 8,000 number hasn't really changed in the last four years that I've tracked the data. It's been there. It's 8,000. What has happened is that the English media do not report this anymore because it's not important that it doesn't concern this two and a half percent of the audience that they are interested in, that the advertiser is interested in. They are not disinterested in the others because of any kind of contempt. It's just that the advertiser that subsidizes the business is not really interested in those people or their stories. And so they have been taken out. 20 years ago, and I'm just using the Times of India as an example because it's the biggest newspaper in English. This holds true for all newspapers in English. It started a section called Bombay Times in, in, in Bombay, and 
what I just spoke of was refined to a very large extent. And um, there was no coverage of anything other than what was called celebrity uh, or page three as it's called in Bombay. Um, and journalists, including me, were given instruction not to cover things that were down market. And we had to cover things which were up market. There's a slight difference between the way these terms are used in India and they're used in the West. In the West, up market would mean high culture, poetry, theater, music, uh, classical music, and so on. In India, up market means n not poor. Down market means those things that concern the poor. So all of that was out of the newspaper and the whole section was devoted entirely to the stories of the parties of the rich. Not just the Times of India, again, all newspapers do it today. But that was the start 20 years ago. Parallelly, um, and this might give you a sort of illustration of what I mean, the same thing happened in Bollywood, that um, the old single screens started to get knocked down in their places, rows, uh, multiplexes, uh, smaller halls, better halls, very good sound, uh, expensive, 200 rupees for a ticket, 300 rupees for a ticket. The content changed. You, you would have 30 years ago, when I was young, you would have the, a protagonist play a coolie or a lavares or things like that. That, that is stopped. Now the hero is from an upper class family. His concerns reflect those of the upper class. You don't have people from that segment represented in our films anymore. Exactly the same thing as has happened in the media. I said that we were concerned now with middle class, upper class anxieties. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Uh, we have three parts of India which are uh, conflict areas. We've got Jammu and Kashmir, we've got the Northeast, and we've got the Tribal Belt. Uh, outside of these three areas, Islamist uh, terrorism, terrorism that happens in the name of an Islamic group as claimed by the state. Fewer than 10 people are killed every year in India. So we're talking about more than a billion people outside of these three areas. So Calcutta and Bombay, Delhi, Hyderabad, Ahmedabad, Bangalore, Surat. Less than 10 a year, including those that we kill as uh, terrorists. Um, the question to ask is whether that justifies the amount of coverage that this subject gets in our media. Uh, and I will leave that for you to decide. I'll, I'll give you a few numbers. I said that there were three areas that had uh, conflicts. Uh, the average uh, in these three areas, deaths of people are killed, um, says that the most people die in what is called left-wing extremism. In, in, uh, well, I, I guess uh, some of that happens near here. So it would be Telangana, Chhattisgarh, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, uh, the coal belt areas. The second highest number of people who die each year is in the Northeast. The third highest, and this is consistently the case and has been for a long time, is in Jammu and Kashmir. So the second thing I would ask you, uh, I would ask uh, you to ask yourselves is whether this, it, it's the same people dying. It's, it's Indians getting killed. It's Indian security forces killing and uh, getting killed um, in all of these three areas. Is this reflected, number one, left-wing extremism in these parts, number two, northeast, number three, Kashmir, in the way that the media covers this? By which I mean to say, does the Northeast and left-wing extremism get the same amount of uh, coverage? And if not, why? Uh, my guess is that it's because of the middle class anxiety, the upper class anxiety. No, two and a half percent can't really be called middle class. This is really the upper class, right? Uh, it's the anxieties uh, that this, this group feels against, against Islam. I wanted to run you through a second set of uh, figures, and this is uh, fatalities in Jammu and uh, Kashmir, where the violence began, 
uh, in the late 80s and uh, uh, continues. Uh, uh, violence in Kashmir peaked in the year 2001. So if we look at the data, in 1988, 31 people died. In 1989, 92. In 1990, things became really bad. 1,100 people died. From then on, it remained there, very violent for a very long time. And in 1991, it was 1,300. In 1992, 1,900. Then 2,500, 2,800. It, it carries on till it reaches 4,500 deaths in the year 2001. After that, each year, it has come down. So. Uh, in, two, in, two, in 2002, it's, it's uh, 3,000, then uh, 2,500, 1,800, 1,700, 1,100. In 2007, after many years, again, it comes down below 1,000. 777, 541, 375, 375, 183. This is in 2011, 117 in 2012, and it's not gone above 200 in the last 10 years. The data shows de-escalation after the peak of 2001. What happens in 2001 that, it's, that things change? It could be 9-11, I don't know. It could also be the fact that after the attack on parliament by uh, Jayesh Mohammed, India mobilizes, uh, General uh, Musharraf uh, tells the world he will switch off the jihad. Whether it's that, whether it's just US uh, pressure on them, I, I can't really say. I can tell you that there is de-escalation, that every year since 2001, and it's been 15 years, violence in Jammu and Kashmir has come down, or terrorist violence, that is to say. If we believe, and I think we believe rightly, that Pakistan is to be blamed for ratcheting it up, we should also concede the fact that they are responsible for bringing it down, but that doesn't seem to happen in the media. Though the, the, the medium run, uh, the, the a medium-term story, or rather, uh, seems to be that things are getting better there, in term, purely in terms of, uh, of a violence by uh, terror groups. Uh, this disproportionate focus on things uh, because of the upper classes' anxieties uh, means that certain things are not written about in newspapers. They are not spoken about on uh, Times Now. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, one is justice. It's not really something that concerns the upper classes. The uh, judicial system has broken down comprehensively. If you have a good lawyer, you could just ask for dates and it would continue into a, a, a perpetuity. Um, but AFSPA, the law that uh, protects the army in the Northeast and in Kashmir, has a, uh, a, a mechanism that lets the state prosecute a soldier if it believes that he or she has done something wrong. It's called Section 7. Now, what has happened is, in Jammu and Kashmir, the police, the state police, have registered uh, criminal cases against members of the Indian Armed Forces since 1989, it could be murder, torture, kidnap, rape, whatever. After having filed the FIR, these cases have been investigated by the JNK police and uh, charges have been filed. That file has been sent to the center for the Delhi government to lift the immunity under Section 7. The number of cases that this has happened in is zero. No, not, not even in one instance has the Indian government allowed the Jammu and Kashmir police to prosecute an individual from the army. Uh, most of us here, certainly in this hall, will, uh, will probably never go to jail. But those Indians who do are sent to jail usually on the basis of suspicion rather than investigation. Often they are sent to jail 
before the crime is actually committed. This is called a preventive uh, detention. And there are laws that governments have, that state governments have, under which they can pick up the people they want and keep them for up to a year without trial, without even filing charges. Now, I'm not talking about uh, terrorism. I'll just read out the names of two laws to you so that you know what I mean. Tamil Nadu prevention of dangerous activities of bootleggers, drug offenders, forest offenders, gundas, immoral traffic offenders, sand offenders, sexual offenders, slum grabbers, and Video Pirates Act of 1982. Uh, second law, the Karnataka prevention of dangerous activities of acid attackers, bootleggers, depredators of the environment, digital offenders, drug offenders, gamblers, gundas, immoral traffic offenders, land grabbers, money launderers, sexual predators, and video or audio pirates act of 1985. What becomes obvious is that the state is adding things, adding a list of offenses to pick people on, on without charge, keeping them for a year because it believes that they might be up to mischief. This 2.5% of the people are unlikely to face this. It's mainly the people under them, the other 97.5% of um, Indians that engage with the state in this way. Um, it, it, it indicates a collapse of the way in which justice is delivered. You can't really convict people. So what you do instead is just pick them up and keep them in jail so that they don't get up to mischief. Second example, health. Um, five lakh Indian children die of malnutrition every year, the highest in the world, as, as uh, we all know. How many times does this get angry debate on the news hour and, on, and in newspapers? I've, I've never seen it. And that's because these, these are not our children who die. These are Indian children who don't belong to this 2.5%. There is not sufficient pressure on the state from media on them to act. And so the state doesn't act. There is a study annually done on, on education in India. Um, and I'll take you through some numbers of the study as it reflects on the quality of education in uh, Gujarat. Uh, and that state because that is where I am from. The study says in 2014 that 78% of students in class 7 could not read a line of, of English, not one line. Uh, and this had come down uh, uh, from 63% about 10 years ago. So it's actually becoming worse. Kids can't read. 74%, sorry, 94% of the children in class 5 could not read line in English. Two-thirds of class three students couldn't read Gujarati text at the level of class one. And 56% of students in class five uh, had, had the same problem, that they couldn't read even Gujarati properly. 87% of students in class seven could not do division. We think of uh, uh, Gujaratis as being very good with uh, arithmetic and with the uh, numbers. Some of us are, it's mainly this 2.5%. The, the others don't get a quality education, but there is no focus on this. 38% of, of Indian children are stunted at age 2. When uh, Naipaul comes to India in the 60s, the first thing he notices is how, in terms of size, there is a difference between the upper classes, which are larger, taller, well-fed and the poor who are smaller. Uh, so this stunting, which is a medical term, refers to mental and physical deficiencies in the children. They will never be able to have the cognitive skills. 38% of this country's population will not have cognitive skills at the level that the others will, 38%. And what this if you look at the debate on reservations, this 2.5% will angrily insist that we hold on to merit. And the children of this, this class 
who go to good schools, um, who have good uh, nourishment, have in some way achieved merit over those 38 percent that have been physically and mentally denied equality. Um, is there any kind of pressure on the state from this two and a half percent through the media? Uh, no. Transport is another thing. The, the governments of Chhattisgarh and the Madhya Pradesh, the BJP governments, when they took power, they shut down the straight transport uh, corporation, the, uh, the buses that, that go from uh, village to town. And, and the reason was that it was not making a, a profit. I think, again, the idea of uh, privatization appeals to this 2.5% because it doesn't consume those services of the state that lead to loss making and it doesn't really have any skin in that game. It is fine if the buses in Chhattisgarh are shut down, but how are the poor supposed to travel in this country? I don't think that is a matter of debate and there's certainly because of the absence of a debate, there is no real pressure on the polity to change or to do something about this. The the health budget of this country is 35,000 crore rupees a year, which is what is spent on 1.25 billion people. A few days ago, we spent 59,000 crore rupees buying 36 warplanes. So, 35,000 crore rupees a year spent on health, 59,000 crore rupees spent on, uh, spent on 36 uh, fighter jets. The last time we used uh, fighter planes, I'm quite certain most most people in the audience will not have been born then. 1971 was, was the last time we used. But has, is there too much of a fight back against this kind of spending? I, I don't see it. 78,000 crore rupees a year is the health budget of, of this country. Uh, 99,000 crore is going to be spent on a, a bullet train from Ahmedabad to Bombay. Is there a debate on what the priorities of this country should be? If there is, I am not, I'm not privy to it. I don't think that there is much by way of anger forget, um, in, in large parts of the population because the poor have no access to the media. They have no voice. Essentially, this 2.5% has strangled the voice of the majority and it determines what the priorities of this nation uh, should be. Uh, this more or less is what I wanted to say. Um, I'll end by, by saying that th th this is a structural problem, that media cannot be expected to be run as anything other than a business with a bottom line. As I told you, uh, Bennett Coleman and company, uh, 9,000 crores, that's a serious business. And these, this, these are run by very serious um, banyas for the most part. Uh, BCCL is owned by Jains, Hindustan Times is owned by the Birlas, Divya Bhaskar that I worked for is owned by uh, Agarwals. They, they tend to be good at this and they are very good at it. To expect them to change the content of the material that they put out and to dismiss the advertiser uh, is not going to happen. Um, and we shouldn't expect them to change. I think that there are certain structural uh, problems that we have, starting with the language issue. That means that this is not going to go away. But the more of us that know that this is the way it is, that a large part of this country has no voice and the part that has a voice, a very loud voice, is focused on things that might not be as important as the things that are drowned out. I thank you very much for your time and your patience. I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. I mean newspapers and uh, televisions do not set uh, the agenda or are not big enough to set the agenda. Uh, the, th the thing about uh, news channels and uh, television and uh, newspapers is that they have a unified voice. They can say one thing 
and people have to debate that. Whereas in social media, it's much more diffused. Uh, when the power of the old media goes, and, and it might at some point, that is when I believe social media might add a significant element. Yes, I can see a lady in this section right at the back where the sound is. Yes, her hand is up. Can the mic go there? Short question, please. Um, so you mentioned all this about media and what they are focusing on. And I myself have been very disturbed about this for years now, which is why I've stopped watching the news channels and reading certain papers. But then what are the alternative sources? Because unfortunately, I am that small percentage who usually consumes all my information in English. So where can I go for the real stories or what's happening in the rest, the ignored part of the country? I, I don't know. There is no unified way for the Indian to access in English. So I'll uh, give an example. There is a law in Chhattisgarh not just in Chhattisgarh, there's a law called the Coal Bearing Areas Act. Basically what it says, the Coal Bearing Areas Act says, every law that precedes it does so in order of importance. So, the Scheduled Caste Atrocities Act also includes scheduled tribes. One of the things about the law says that if you take Adivasi land without consent, that is a crime. Coal Bearing Areas Act says, okay, not for us. Government of India can come and take coal from an Adivasi without consent. Lata Mangeshkar vetoed a flyover in front of a house on a pedal road because she didn't want her view to be uh, disturbed. Adivasis have no ownership over their land. If there is violence in the Adivasi areas, we should understand what the causes are. I don't think the 2.5% cares. We want the coal because we want the power. What the laws are doing to that community, I don't think we have a deep interest in. It will not be reported. The, and the reason I said this was, yesterday, four people were killed in Jharkhand because they were protesting the taking away of their land. They were shot by, by the police. In any civilized democracy, if four blacks get killed in the US, the media will bring the house down. They will not let anybody else speak. It will not happen in India because we have other things to do. The Indrani Mukherjee case has the latest development or something else. And this is the other bit. Arnab Goswami will give the same amount of passion and devotion to Indrani Mukherjee's latest development as he will to war. So I think that there is another aspect of the media that we need to understand that this being driven by the material, the monetary aspect is real. As many people will, will be interested in knowing about whether or not, you know, a Peter Mukherjee did this, that or the other. It's a real problem. I sent the mic at the back. Has it reached? Uh, this new phenomenon of uh, online news portals, uh, most, some of them not, not for profit. Do you see that bringing in any change in the media? Like, for instance, the wire dot in. Do you see that uh, bringing any change in online? I said online uh, news portals. I said subsidized readers, not subsidized media. It is the reader who is subsidized. Um, it's the same community that accesses um, the online material, and though it, the wire is an independent media organ, the problem is that it doesn't have the reach of mainstream media. It doesn't have any means of making money. Long term, it has some money from the Azim Premji Foundation. Long term, what happens to this will be determined by whether or not things can be independent. I think media that is not independent will not be very loud and it will not be able to sustain itself. Akarji, Angrezi is a language और बहुत समय से रही है इसके साथ साथ जो कॉर्पोरेट ओनरशिप और मोनोपोली मीडिया पर है जो मेनस्ट्री मीडिया है इसका क्या विकल्प है क्योंकि हिंदी अंग्रेजी तमाम जगह जो कॉर्पोरेट ओनरशिप है वो डिसाइड कर रही है कि कवरेज कैसे होगा इवन जो पॉलिटिकल कवरेज कैसे होगा 
उसमें आपको क्या लगता है कि कोई विकल्प की स्थिति बन रही है और द कॉर्पोरेट ओनरशिप द काइंड ऑफ पोजिशन इट इज हैविंग ऑन द डिफरेंट फॉर्म्स ऑफ द मीडिया इंक्लूडिंग द वेब हाउ यू सी द काइंड ऑफ कंडीशन ऑफ द डेमोक्रेसी इन द मीडिया मेरा ये मानना है और आ, ये कुछ सालों से हो रहा है कि जो 30 साल पहले जो सहाफी को जो जर्नलिस्टों को फ्रीडम जो था आज वो नहीं रहा और बहुत सारे ऐसे मुद्दे हैं जिन पर वो लिख नहीं सकते एक वजह ये है कि शायद वहाँ पे कोई कॉपरेट इंटरेस्ट हो दूसरी वजह ये है कि मीडिया ने खुद ये मान लिया है कि उनका जो पाठक है और जो नाजरीन है उनका वो इन चीज़ों में ज़रा भी इंटरेस्ट नहीं रखता तो जिस सो द स्टोरी आई टोल्ड यू अबाउट ऑन द फोर पीपल बीइंग शॉट आई डोंट थिंक दिस बिन मच कवरेज ऑफ इट एंड दैट्स वन रीजन दैट जर्नलिस्ट हैव एक्सेप्टेड दैट दिस इज द रियलिटी ऑफ इंडिया सो वी शुडन एक्सपेक्ट जर्नलिस्ट टू कम एंड सेव अस फ्रॉम दिस इट्स नॉट गोइंग टू है नमस्कार इधर सबसे पहले आपके व्याख्यान के लिए धन्यवाद मैं दो बातें बोलना चाहूंगा संक्षिप्त में पहली बात तो जो आपने पत्रकारिता और जो न्यूज प्रिंट मीडिया है उसके बारे में बात किया सब्सिडी के बारे में बात किया अगर आपको याद हो तो 80 के और 90 के दशक में पत्रकारिता का जो व्यवसाय था वो बैकसीट पर चला गया था टू एन एक्सटेंट की वो उपहास का हंसी का पात्र बन गया था और उस जमाने में जो हिंदी को लेते हैं हिंदी में जो पत्रकारिता थी साप्ताहिक हिंदुस्तान धर्म योग कादम्बरी इसमें कुछ कंटेंट आता था हंस था उससे पहले लेकिन अचानक पता नहीं ऐसा क्या हुआ कि पत्रकारों का कुछ प्रायरिटीज चेंज हुई क्या चेंज हुआ उनका कंटेंट उसी स्टोव फटने तक ले, से लेकर शौच गई महिला के बलात्कार से लेकर वहीं तक सीमित रह गया तो जो आप परोस रहे हैं बात वहीं तक सीमित रह जा रही है बात वो ढाई की या साढ़े तीन की आंकड़ों में नहीं है बात मेरे हिसाब से वहां आके अटक रही है कि क्या आप परोस रहे हैं जो भास्कर ग्रुप है प्रकाशन ग्रुप है जो भी इस तरह के ग्रुप हैं, शायद वो कम करके आंक रहे हैं हमारे ग्रामीण क्षेत्र की जनसंख्या को मेरे हिसाब से और दूसरा मैं आपको एक बात बताना चाहूंगा कि 2001 में जब ये हत्याओं का सिलसिला कम हुआ जम्मू कश्मीर में तो आपने कई लोगों के नाम लिए कि शायद मुशरफ ने मुशरफ ने बोला कि जिहाज वापस लेंगे या नौ ग्यारह हुआ लेकिन आपने सेना का जिक्र नहीं किया कि उन्नीस में जब एम्प्लॉयमेंट हुआ राशि राइफल्स बनी आप प्रश्न पूछ लीजिए जल्दी से हाँ बस खत्म हो गया डेल्टा फोर्स मुंबई फोर्स किलो फोर्स हुआ हम लोग हम लोगों को जो काउंटर इंसर्जेंसी में महारत हासिल हुई शायद उसको भी एक बड़ा योगदान माना जा सकता है इन सब चीजों की कमी में और मेरे हिसाब से वो एक क्रेडिबल एक अच्छा योगदान दिया जा सकता है उनको धन्यवाद वन मोर क्वेश्चन लेडी दस माई क्वेश्चन there is such a large leadership uh, readership in the regional media how are we to understand the fact that they have such little say or uh, you know ability to lobby with the government one of the issues is that the middle the the upper class is unified there is no way that a poor gujarati can communicate with the poor uh, telugu woman but somebody in kashmir from the upper class the fact that a gujarati is here today in a city which speaks telugu uh, i live in a place that speaks uh, kannada i i stay in bangalore means that there is something that unifies us there is an absence of that for for most of the country the issues of the poor gujarati remain confined to that state and they have no national voice similarly the case for the bengali and the malayali and the uh, tamilian that it remains restricted whereas the concerns that we have tend to become national in the nature hi uh, thank you for your talk uh, so i uh, one uh, thing i wanted to understand uh, are are efforts being made to encourage and fund uh, responsible news paper news making in english because obviously there's some problem on the uh, so called uh, the readers who are uh, you know developing some kind of tastes so if you have to like force it from the supply side responsible news making are there some efforts being made on that side newspapers are a dying industry they are uh, the the readership survey has not come out in the last 2 years because newspaper owners don't want the numbers to actually come out uh, 
leaderships have uh, plateaued. In, in, in Bombay, they have stayed the same for about 15 years. Um, nobody is actually investing in newspapers anymore now. I think it's new media that uh, people are putting some amounts of money in. It doesn't at the moment have the voice that newspapers and the channels still have, but that might change. So thank you, Akarji. Ladies and gentlemen, we close this session. Thank you very much.